America's team is in town. Ever wonder why the Dallas Cowboys are called America's team? America's team. America's team. Some say it has to do with winning, which, okay, America is big on winning, but... How about them Cowboys? Well, they hold the NFL record for most consecutive winning seasons with 20, and with Landry and Staubach in the 70s, plus the Aikman-Irvin-Smith trio in the 90s, America's team won five NFL titles and played in eight Super Bowls, the second most all-time. America is also big on money, and you can't talk about the Cowboys without mentioning their astronomical net worth of over $9 billion, the most valuable sports team in the world. But what have you done for America lately, Dallas? You haven't won a championship in 27 years, so why do we still call the Cowboys America's team? Well, get your popcorn ready, because it wasn't a name Dallas ran right out the gate. In fact, in 1960, the Cowboys were more like America's doormat. Dallas lost 11 games in their first season, then followed that up with five straight seasons without a winning record. But what the Cowboys lacked in W's early on, they more than made up for by quickly becoming one of the NFL's most recognizable brands. The groundwork of what would become an American institution was laid out by owner Clint Murchison Jr., who thankfully bailed on his original choice of team name, the Dallas Steer and pivoted to a name more mainstream than a castrated ox. Instead, he named the team after the iconic American Cowboy, a symbol synonymous with hard work, heroism, honorable behavior, respect, and patriotism, a true reflection of core American values in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And no disrespect, but no other pro football team at the time had a name with as much national and patriotic appeal as the Cowboy. The finishing touch that hammered the brand home came from legendary Dallas GM Tech Schramm, who introduced the team's iconic star logo and had it decaled on every helmet, something that only a handful of teams did at the time. So, are we saying the Dallas Cowboys did something that over 60 years later, the Cleveland Browns still haven't figured out how to do? Oh, sh but just as recognizable as the Blue Star was the team's next big innovation. Huge, in fact, the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. The ladies were a Texas-sized sensation with sideline routines that drew crazy new attention to Dallas football, helping ignite a growing national fan base excited to tune in or show up to see every kick, twirl, and bounce each and every Sunday. America was watching. Now all Dallas needed were solid players, like ones who knew the difference between a shotgun formation and an actual shotgun. Very popular in Texas, by the way. Fortunately, the Cowboys had a true native Texan behind the coaching reign, the great Tom Landry. His stoic demeanor and innovative style of play was the bedrock of the team, and Landry accepted the challenge of shaping the Cowboys' personnel into something special. Tucked under his signature trench coat, Landry came armed with a progressive new approach to player scouting that packed almost as much firepower as his legendary doomsday defense. The Cowboys held many camps and open tryouts, encouraged colleges to host pro days to showcase potential talent, and even introduced state-of-the-art computer scouting. This groundbreaking work enabled Dallas to rarely miss in the draft, which brought in numerous future Hall of Famers, including Bob Hayes, Randy White, Mel Renfro, and the great Tony Dorsett. Damn, was Tony Dorsett next level? But Dallas's gutsiest pick came in the 10th round of the 64 draft when the Cowboys selected Roger Staubach, a Heisman Trophy winning quarterback most teams completely removed from their draft board, considering the All-American a huge risk. You see, Staubach played for Navy, you know, the U.S. Naval Academy, meaning he'd have to serve five years active duty, which would likely include a tour in Vietnam, before ever taking a single NFL snap. But the Cowboys did their homework and saw a huge upside in securing a Heisman winning play caller, despite his school's active duty clause. Fast forward five years, and the future America's team was was now quarterbacked by a true American hero. The United States war vet was embraced by fans around the nation, not just for his service in Vietnam or his confident Captain America-like persona, but mostly because the dude could straight up ball. Staubach's innovation of the Hail Mary and knack for creative end-of-game heroics pulled in new fans from all corners of the country, making the Cowboys impossible to ignore. Staubach orchestrated the Cowboy offense like a true maestro of the game and led Dallas to their first Super Bowl appearance in only his second season under center. 
One year later, in 72, Staubach drove the offense with near-military-like precision and secured Dallas their first world title in Super Bowl VI after toppling the Dolphins 24-3. Landry and Staubach competed in three more Super Bowls that decade, along the way earning a second world championship for the Cowboys trophy case. Dallas's five Super Bowl appearances were the most of any team in the 1970s and, at that time, the most ever. Dallas's success throughout the 70s led to more and more exposure, higher TV ratings, greater merchandise sales, and even more national fandom as Cowboy Nation became the best-traveled fan base in America, often watering down the opposition's home team colors, filling the stands with a sea of blue and silver. It was these very Dallas fans who helped make the Cowboys a holiday institution, rolling out in droves for a Thanksgiving Day slot no other team besides the Lions wanted anything to do with. Most NFL owners were concerned ticket sales and television views would be lower than low, thinking few families wanted their Thanksgiving interrupted by mere football. But, as always, Dallas was looking through a completely different lens and hopped into the opportunity. More national exposure on a true American holiday, no less, meant more eyeballs on the brand and a grander stage to further align the Cowboys as a fixture of Americana. Cowboys on Thanksgiving was a huge hit and has become as much a staple of the holiday as the Macy's Parade and Thanksgiving dinner itself. Speaking of legs and thighs, it wasn't just on the field where things were growing for the Cowboys. Bigger and bigger things were happening to arguably the most famous cheerleading squad on the planet. I mean, how many fan bases can say their team's cheerleaders have a poster hanging in the Smithsonian, appeared on an episode of The Love Boat, sold dolls, and were the inspiration for the most watched adult film in the 21st century? America couldn't get enough of America's team. Hang on there, Jimmy Johnson. Not ready for you yet. First, how did the Cowboys get the name America's Team? See, following Super Bowl XII, NFL Films produced a video recapping the Cowboys' 1978 season, a season which ended, well, not well. All back pumps. That's all. Picked off in the end zone. Despite the loss, NFL Films still needed a film with a positive spin, along with a title to match, anything to help excite fans for the upcoming season. Producers scoured through hours of Cowboys footage until the light bulb went off. NFL Films discovered the one thing a Super Bowl defeat could never take away from the Dallas Cowboys, their national popularity. Most NFL fan bases at the time were limited to those living in or near that team's city. But Dallas fans spanned across America. The Cowboys weren't just Dallas's team, they were America's team. It was the perfect name. The new nickname spread like wildfire. Before Dallas's first game of the 79 season, Pat Summerall introduced them on Monday Night Football as America's team, and there was no turning back. But not everyone was tipping their cap, or better yet, their fedora, in celebration of the new team moniker. Coach Landry felt America's team put a target on their back and provided opposing teams with extra incentive to knock off the new so-called national team of sports. And maybe there was some truth behind Landry's words, because while America's team merchandise, ticket sales, and TV ratings boomed, suddenly the Cowboys were winning less and less. But it wasn't all bad. Dallas was still the league's biggest draw, consistently stealing the national spotlight and proving the Dallas star shined brightest when playing on the national stage, even earning the record for most wins in Monday Night Football history. Everyone was watching. It was even said Texas Stadium had a hole in its roof so God himself could watch his favorite team play at home. Even if... As the 80s rolled on, Landry's once dominant team continued their slide well below the 500 mark. But change was on the Texas horizon, and it came in the form of Texas oil tycoon Jerry Jones, who in 1989 purchased America's team for $140 million. It was a high-stakes gamble, considering the sale of an NFL team for a nine-figure sum was unprecedented at the time. Coupled with the Cowboys losing close to $1 million a month, it didn't take Jones long to realize his new team needed money, fast. So, one of Jerry's first business decisions to get Dallas out of the red was to do something no other had done before. He sidestepped the NFL's league-wide revenue-sharing agreement. For years, all team endorsement and licensing agreements ran through the NFL marketing department, who then split up the profits equally among teams. 
Always a maverick, Jones went out on his own and locked down huge endorsement deals with Pepsi, Nike, American Express, and Dr. Pepper, allowing the Cowboys to secure every penny of their million-dollar deals without having to share with the league. It was an entirely new revenue stream, never before seen in the NFL, and helped flood the struggling franchise with much-needed cash. Other league owners weren't exactly down with Dallas circumventing the system like that. Nonetheless, opposition only ignited a fire in the belly of the new owner, and further strengthened his determination to resurrect the NFL's most storied franchise. The NFL ultimately filed a lawsuit against the Cowboys for ducking the revenue-sharing agreement, but Dallas clapped back with a suit of their own. Jones and the NFL settled their suits less than a year later, allowing the Cowboys to continue negotiating their own marketing and licensing deals without splitting profits. One of Jerry's more forward-thinking deals was how he got Nike to compensate Dallas in exchange for his coaches only wearing Nike apparel, a practice that has since become standard across the NFL. But outside-the-box thinking of the new Cowboys ownership wasn't limited to just new revenue streams. When it came to team management, Jerry simply went about things Jerry's way. He redefined the role of NFL owner, breaking away from what he saw as a backwards operating model, where key decisions were left solely to coaches and executives. Jones was hands-on, actively involved in all football operations, even going so far as to appoint himself team president and general manager. And one of Jerry's first orders as GM was a bold one. He fired beloved head coach Tom Landry. This wasn't the way Landry had planned on leaving his team, and it certainly wasn't his choice. The decision sent shockwaves through the football community, but ultimately paved the way for a new era of Cowboys dominance, led by newly hired head coach Jimmy Johnson. All right, Jimmy, now you can say it. How about them Cowboys? Well, Jimmy, them Cowboy fans were feeling not too good about the sudden dismissal of Landry. But I think that Buddy Ryan of Philadelphia's got more class than our new owner, Jerry Jones. <laughs> the only coach the franchise had ever known and the architect behind an NFL record 20 straight winning seasons. But with Jerry's unrivaled determination and vision, coupled with Jimmy Johnson's tactical precision, Dallas fans weren't given much time to fume. Jerry got to work, not just rebuilding a football team, but constructing a globally recognizable sports brand, synonymous with excellence. And Jerry did it by shooting for the stars, both figuratively and literally. Demarcus Ware, Deion Sanders, Terrell Owens, Des Bryant, Dak Prescott, Ezekiel Elliott all came through Dallas under Jerry's advisement. But one of his finest player decisions was his very first, selecting stud quarterback Troy Aikman number one overall in the 1989 NFL Draft. The following year, Jones struck gold again with Emmitt Smith, a running back most teams thought was too small for the pros. But always the risk taker, Jones scooped up Smith with the 17th overall pick. And considering that Smith still holds the all-time rushing record, the pick is considered one of the biggest draft day steals in NFL history. With Aikman, Smith, and of course receiver Michael Irvin, Dallas had a sensational trifecta of star power which fueled the re-emergence of America's team, winning three Super Bowl championships in four years, a feat no team or owner had ever before accomplished. America's team was back, and Jones jumped at the opportunity to capitalize on the success of the Cowboys of the 90s. Jerry did it by creating the league's first team-owned merchandise company, which designs and manufactures shirts, towels, kitchen utensils, mouse pads, basically anything you could fit the words America's team on, and distributes them to retail shops across the globe year-round. And while two-plus decades have passed since the Cowboys' 27-17 win over the Steelers in Super Bowl 30, Jerry Jones and his Cowboys are still firmly seated among the upper echelon of America's sports royalty. But what's a royal dynasty without its crown jewel? Jerry Jones spearheaded a revolution with the NFL stadium landscape when, in 2009, he opened AT&T Stadium, considered the crown jewel of sports venues. It's an architectural marvel, reflecting Jerry's love for over-the-top spectacle both on and off the field. The breathtaking stadium became a symbol of Texas-sized American ambition and remains a testament to Jones's unwavering commitment to delivering an extraordinary fan experience, while simultaneously generating numerous new revenue streams. And in some cases, the Cowboys' money-making deals look more like tsunamis than mere streams. Case in point, Dallas's unreal $200 million endorsement extension with Molson Coors to be the only beer provider at AT&T Stadium. 
Jerry's other big win business move, which continues to keep the Cowboys' money faucet turned on year-round, is Legend Hospitality Group, which he co-founded with George Steinbrenner. This allows the Cowboys to own all the concession and merchandise sales at stadiums under contract with Legends. Today, Jerry's Hospitality Group is worth $1.35 billion, ensuring the Cowboys will continue to stand tall as the most valuable organization in all of football. All of this has contributed to America's team's current estimated worth of $9.2 billion, making the Cowboys the most lucrative sports franchise on the planet. And while it's fair to question whether or not the Cowboys are still America's team, what's not up for debate is that Blitz is America's favorite new football channel. So be sure to like, subscribe, and check out some of our other videos.